Hello, welcome to our program. My name is Carrie Leroy. I'm an attorney based in Palo Alto, mother of three boys, and I'm also a trustee of Global AIDS Interfaith Alliance, or GAIA, which is a 501c3 nonprofit organization that focuses on empowering communities affected by the HIV crisis in Sub Saharan Africa, in particular the country of Malawi, to build health care capacity and to raise the status of women. Um, and to bring hope to these communities that really have um, no other resources. Today I'm here with the Gaia co-founder co and president emeritus, Dr. Bill Rankin, as well as our current president, Todd Schaefer. And they're here to speak with us today about the accomplishments of the organization, as well as the future of the organization and our, um, the look forward. So just a little bit about myself. I joined the Gaia board because I was so inspired after hearing Bill Rankin talk about the amazing accomplishments of this organization and how they were bringing basically hope to some of the most um, vulnerable people in the world, including HIV, AIDS, orphans, and widows. Um, I was particularly inspired by the emphasis on empowering women and bringing hope to, um, to children, but in, and in particular the nursing programs and microfinance pro programs that could enable um, women to pull themselves out of poverty and to have some hope for the future. Um, so I was very impressed by Gaia's track record of developing long-term effective programs to really meet the challenges of the HIV crisis in Sub-Saharan Africa. So Bill, let's start with you. So Gaia was founded in 2000, around the time when the AIDS epidemic was killing millions of people in Sub-Saharan Africa. So can you tell us a little bit about how the organization got started? We got started in 2000, uh, shortly after the man who had been for 30 years chief of neurosurgery at UCSF, Dr. Charles Wilson, had given me a drug study that was published in an August 1999 Lancet. That's a British medical publication. And it showed um, the results of a drug trial in Uganda where uh, HIV positive pregnant women who were in danger of giving birth to HIV positive neonates were given one tablet of a particular antiretroviral, that means anti-HIV medication at the onset of labor. And then their infants were given the same drug in syrup form within 72 hours of the baby's birth. And uh, for $4 in those years, but the cost is a lot less now, uh, you could reduce by 50% the probability that the mom would pass virus to the baby during the perinatal period. And we knew that every day in the countries south of the Saharan Desert, about 2,000 babies were born HIV positive. And we also knew that in the poorest countries, the most reliable infrastructure to reach those villages and the people in them were the religious organizations, a variety of Christian and Muslim groups. And so all those elements became part of the design that makes Gaia relatively unique in uh, doing this work. Yeah. And, and so why is it that you decided to focus on Malawi in particular? We started out in some other African countries, but when we got to Malawi, a, mu a friend of mine who is a Zimbabwean working for the World Bank, introduced me to a man named Jones Laviwa, who is now our country director. The other leadership people at Gaia and I were immediately and strongly impressed with uh, the personal integrity of uh, Jones Laviwa and his professional competence. And we decided to build on him in the initial stages. Then, after we got underway there, it came home to us more and more that Malawi is, even by African standards, an extremely poor country. And so it seemed almost unforgivable to even contemplate pulling out of there. And so we've stayed and thrown all of our resources into that tiny, very poor country. So. Now I would think we're going to show a slide of, um, of Jesse. Um, could you tell us about, a little bit about this girl in this picture, Bill? Yeah, we met Jesse in 2004 
the year when the health ministry in Malawi was all too slowly beginning to roll out antiretroviral medications. She was very symptomatic at the time for both asthma and tuberculosis. In Malawi, TB is a marker for HIV in as much as that about 80% of the people suffering from tuberculosis also are positive for HIV. So uh, on top of that, we knew that her parents were both HIV positive. We say amongst ourselves that every trip we take to Malawi, we meet at least one person who um, seems to steal our hearts. And that happened in this case with this little girl. I think uh, she was six, six years old. And uh, quick off the mark, more than anything else, she wanted to go back to school. But she was so sick she couldn't go. And she got all dressed up for the Americans. If you recall the photo, the shoes are about three sizes too large for her. Mm -hmm. But anyway, we tried, to make the story short, we tried over the next two and a half years to, um, to keep her alive. The problem was that her parents were, as I said, HIV positive, And they were very concerned about HIV-related stigma. So they were in deep denial and felt they could solve her health needs by patronizing the witch doctor. Mm -hmm. And uh, we failed to get her the treatment she needed. And uh, in 2006, at the end of the year, she died and was buried uh, the next day in her village. It's very tragic. Mm -hmm. So, Todd, the HIV AIDS crisis is now about 30 years old, and um, many people think of it as something that is under control. Um, it certainly is in the United States. Um, and, and there are people are able to access antiretroviral therapies. And so why is it that we should still focus on HIV prevention treatment, um, in particular in Malawi? Well, that's, that's the biggest challenge that we face, is that people have gotten tired. And it, I guess it's normal to have gotten tired in this very long, bloody battle um, that has claimed so many people. But when you're absolutely right when you say that in the U.S. it seems that we've won the war. Um, the antiretroviral therapies that are widespread in the U.S., and as soon as you have a diagnosis of being HIV positive, you're placed onto an antiretroviral therapy. That is not the case yet in Africa. And as a result, there are still a million people a year dying in sub-Saharan Africa. In Malawi alone, uh, there's about, there is about 54,000 people die every year of AIDS, wow. um, compared to about 17,000 in the US. And when you adjust for the fact that the US is about 20 times as big as Malawi, population-wise, um, the AIDS topic is still white hot in Africa. Right. Um, that's not to say that we should be discouraged about the progress that's being made in Africa, because it is clearly the case that we're gaining traction and that the progress that we've made is miraculous. Uh, not so long ago, the trajectory for HIV incidents seemed like it was headed towards 100%. I mean, we were at 25% in numerous sub-Saharan countries. Wow. Uh, now, while that's the, the rates of HIV are still much too high, They've leveled off, um, and they've started to fall. That's important, um, both because it's important that the rate fall, but it's also mathematically significant that the rates are falling because of antiretrovirals. People who are on the therapy are living longer. So you can be HIV positive for many years. And that messes with the statistics. Instead of dropping off in 12, 18 months when you die, someone now counts as HIV positive potentially for 20, 30, 40 years. Um, when, you, when you add all that into the mix, you can see we still have a very big problem, but we're making a lot of progress. Right, I see. And so, so what is Gaia doing specifically to combat the spread of HIV? What kind of programs do you have in place right now that are helping to combat the disease? Well, I think that Bill's um, approach in recent years was exactly the right one, and it's, the, it's considered best practices in the international development community. Um, I've been living in Africa for about six years and have met um, a lot of people working in the HIV uh, community. 
what Gaia is doing that is at the very best, along with um, some other organizations, is they realize that it's the whole village, the whole community that has been devastated by, by AIDS, and not just those who are HIV positive. Um, up on the screen, you see some where our core programs are located. And the, the key element that you're going to see here, it's a, a bit of a busy graphic, but you can, you can see that we're doing a variety of things that overlay onto each other. And recognizing that the social fabric of these villages has been devastated. When I first arrived in Malawi and went to a village for the first time, I was struck by how many children there are and how few adults, how few caregivers and breadwinners there are for those kids. So Gaia's approach is to support the whole village. And we do that through our Villages program, um, which does community education. It does hospice care. It does nursing back to health. It does support for orphans. Uh, we have a mobile clinic program that goes into those same villages on a regular rotating basis and brings a full clinic to remote areas that had no access to health care. And the third major program we have is really trying to rebuild the backbone of the Malawian healthcare system, which is nurses. And uh, to date, we've supported about 300 nurses through nursing school. And many of the rural clinics around Malawi now are staffed by Gaia-supported nurses who are now, much as the public health service does in the US, mm -hmm. they're paying back their scholarship by reporting for duty in a remote rural clinic. That's fantastic. And so, so why, does, um, why does Gaia focus on women's empowerment in particular? Well, it's been long established in uh, international development, and I imagine it's probably also been long established here in the US, that the way to, uh, to support a family is to support the mother of the family. And the way to get to the mothers of the family is to get them while they're still girls and are not yet in charge of a family. Mm -hmm. And so much of what we do, whether it's through our microfinance program or through our nursing program, or through the Villages program that's done entirely through women serving as community caregivers, we empower the women in the communities to lift those whole, those whole villages up. Right. And, so, and, and uh, so the approach is to focus on villages. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Is, um, you know, why, why does Gaia focus specifically on, on villages, on rural villages? Well, we do it, on, the focus is on village really in two ways. One is that it's the village, not the city. There are a lot of supports being put in place by other organizations in urban areas. Uh, urban areas have very high incidences, incidence rates of HIV. But there are many other actors there. Mm -hmm. um, we're largely alone where we work. Um, in the remote rural villages that are hard to get to, it's a largely a result of logistics, um, we're the only game in town for these people. And so that was, we went to the most neglected areas, and those are villages. But secondly, it's this holistic view that we need to we need to build up the whole village mm -hmm. and not just those who are actively HIV positive or uh, in full-blown AIDS. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So I think we're now going to roll a short clip of a Malawian child speaking. Um, I'm going to have that clip. And maybe, Billy, you could tell us a little bit about this child. Sure. Yeah. She's an orphan. It just happens that she's typical. She would like to thank the Gaia team for caring after orphans here in Matindi. You gave us blankets. Before you came, we were covering ourselves with rugs or sacks. You gave us soap. You gave her a, a beautiful dress, as you can see. So, soap, gold oil, and school material, exercise books, and ball pens. She would like Gaia to continue with, uh, with his activities so that she can continue with their education. She would like to ask the Almighty. Oh, that was a great clip. Um, so, so Bill, you've um, you started Gaia twelve years ago. So, can you tell us what you you think are the the main accomplishments of the organization in the past ten years? Yeah. Todd very nicely summarized the current programs. I think um, measuring where we are now. 
with respect to where we had been when we started. And focusing for the moment on the Villages program, we got a very nice grant in 2003 from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to, to build a women's empowerment program in the rural areas of the southern part of Malawi, which is the most highly impacted part of the country, both in terms of abject poverty and also HIV prevalence. And we started out with 25 villages, and we were in each of those and are in each village for a total of three years. We hire, uh, train, equip, and deploy four to five women caregivers per village. And uh, they take care of the orphans and also the, do the home-based care visits and deliver health messages and on and on. And Todd covered that nicely. We went from 25 villages in the beginning to now 137. Wow. And I think I said we stay in each village for a total of three years. The second uh, program area is the microloan program. We started with zero, and we now have uh, a total of 2,415 women on microloans. And the changes that you see with those women are extraordinary. They, they tend to be extremely reticent as African women. And then once they get into the program, everything changes, and they really mean business. And they even get their husbands and boyfriends working for them. They're very entrepreneurial. Um, with respect to the mobile health clinics, we got a lot of help from Elizabeth Taylor and her mm -hmm. foundation. And they bought the three vehicles that we have and also pay for the f crews of four people each per vehicle and also the medications including um, anti-malarial medications, antibiotics and the like and the rapid tests for HIV and for malaria. And, and I should also add that in the villages one of the things we do is to distribute anti-malarial bed nets. Uh, malaria happens to be be the biggest killer of children under mm -hmm. the age of five. And so we've done a lot, I think, to keep little kids alive. And the nurses now, as Todd said, we have graduated 120 of those nurses who are deployed now to the government uh, district hospitals and rural clinics. And we have 181 still in process. And we recently, by the way, just signed a a uh, five-year grant with USAID to deliver what's called basic emergency obstetrical care and other uh, capabilities to 400 Malawi nurses, among mm -hmm. other things. So I, I, it's grown tremendously, and I just must say, not least because of the immense generosity of an awful lot of people in the Bay Area. That's a very impressive track record. So, Todd, as the um, new president of Gaia, where do you see Gaia going in the next few years or the, dir the direction of the, the organization? Well, I remember being asked this question when I was interviewing for the job, and I was afraid, to, I was afraid how I could answer it and come <laughs> up with the right answer. Um, I have a much better answer for, for it now because I've actually visited the programs. Mm -hmm. And I can say with great certainty that much of what we're doing is exactly right, and I just want to keep doing it. Um, but I want to do more of it, particularly with respect to the mobile clinics. We need more mobile clinics in more districts, serving more villagers who don't have access. Sure. Um, in terms of the nurses, the shortage, we, we're doing 300. We've got the, the math of the, uh, the nurse calculations that Bill gave you suggests that we've done 300 nurses. We've supported 300 nurses in school, uh, which is a lot. But there's only 5,000 nurses in the country. Mm -hmm. So we've added a big chunk, but the shortage is immense. We really need to grow that program. The other thing that I would say, the only thing we're going to do differently is invite others to layer their good works on top of ours. And what we're doing in the village program is, uh, is really a platform onto which many other non-governmental organizations um, can add their particular skill set. They can come in and dig a well. 
They can come in and do their form of micro savings. Um, they can come in and teach agricultural techniques. Uh, but we've laid the groundwork already with the villages. That I think that in the future, Gaia is going to bring in other partners to have a greater impact on the same uh, beneficiaries. It sounds very promising. So all of this and hearing about um, Gaia's mission and the progress, in some respects, though, it can seem very intimidating. What could an individual do to make a difference or to get involved? Um, individuals, groups, um, churches, service clubs, anything like that. Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, the good news is that Gaia is very lean and mean. Um, while we do have 58 employees, uh, I think 51 of them are in Malawi. Um, and things in Malawi are quite inexpensive. And we can put uh, donations to great use, and they can go a very long way. Um, for example, I think there's a, up on, this, on the screen, there's a variety of, of the costs to Gaia. And you can see some of the things that we include in an orphan kit is a blanket okay. um, that, you know, it's, very, it's quite affordable. We also do lots and lots of HIV kits, lots and lots of malaria kits. Each of these, these things require money. Um, all the way up to supporting an entire mobile health clinic in the way the Elizabeth Taylor Foundation does and all the elements of that, that clinic. But donations. Donations have been what's allowed Gaia to grow to where it is. And individual donations are particularly valuable to us, both because we need the money and because they provide incredible flexibility that we don't have when we uh, get a big institutional grant that has a lot of requirements to it. Right. With individual contributions, we're able to react quickly when we see a need and we see an opportunity. Okay, so I, there are many different organizations that are focused on relief work, humanitarian efforts, um, and fa ta trying to tackle really difficult issues of poverty. Um, what would you say motivates individuals and institutional um, supporters of Gaia specifically? Well, I think there's a couple of things. One is the interfaith angle. And when I was working in Rwanda, one of the most effective groups that I saw was uh, a group of, it was called the Rwandan Interfaith Network Against AIDS. And the most amazing thing about it is that these are groups that where religion has almost replaced tribalism in that that's where great animosity exists between the groups. And the religious groups almost across faiths have done enormous damage historically with regard to HIV um, in terms of promoting these, the stigma that has surrounded, has surrounded HIV. But with some of these interfaith approaches where we're getting act, you know, Pentecostals to sit down next to Muslims and all together agree on some very basic positive messages such as HIV is a virus. It's not a sin, it's a virus. And those kind of approaches that take advantage of infrastructure that's on the ground and then cross across the faith groups are very, very powerful. And I think that, uh, I think that Gaia really benefits from, from that reality. The other thing is, while we are Gaia, which is global AIDS, the fact that we focus so intensely on Malawi and so intensely on particular areas of Malawi allows us to really have a transformative impact. If we were spread thin, if we took our entire budget and spread it over sub-Saharan Africa, we would do nothing. But we're making a major difference in Mulanji. And by making a difference in Mulanji, we're influencing what's happening in Malawi, and we're influencing what's happening throughout sub-Saharan Africa. You're tackling one corner of the world at a time, right? That's the idea. It's fantastic. So um, given what you've heard today, um, you may want to learn more about Gaia. You may want to support Gaia. Um, you can visit Gaia's website at www.thegaia.org. And you can find information on the website about the various programs that we've heard about today, as well as ways to donate. Um, and also, we're very excited to announce um, our garden party fundraiser on April 29th. It's going to be held at a uh, private home in Atherton. And there's information on the Gaia website site about the program. Uh, as you can see here, we have as our keynote, keynote speaker, Dr. Abraham Verghese, who's um, a very well-known author of the best-selling novel, Cutting for Stone. 
and also as our MC for the day, um, Anne Lamott, who's also a very prolific writer. Um, and we're very excited about the event. It's going to be a lovely afternoon, and we would love to have a great turnout of support for the incredible work of this organization. And you, too, in the Silicon Valley can make a difference in the lives of people who are completely desperate and without hope in the far corners of the world, in particular in Malawi. And this is a great organization. Um, we appreciate your support. Thank you. So um, before we sign off, we're going to leave you with a, um, a beautiful short video. It's about a grave. It's a video of a graveyard, and it's um, it's a it's a Malawi poem. And Bill is going to tell us a little bit more about that. This was filmed by a wonderful young woman in Mill Valley, whom we flew over to Malawi with us on one occasion. She uh, spent the night before this video was filmed out in the bush, and arose early the next morning with the women, and uh, they are doing what's called over there grave cleaning. It'll give you a sense of uh, an interesting cultural aspect of Malawi and at the same time it'll enable you to see a little more poignantly the devastation of HIV and AIDS. <laughs> Thank you very much for being with us today and for learning about Gaia and this very important work. Um, thank you, Bill. Thank you, Todd. We appreciate you being here with us today, and we appreciate your support. Again, if you're interested in learning more about Gaia, you can visit the website at www.thegaia.org. Thank you. Yende, 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 yende,